Amen. And you can go ahead and have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Some of you I, I saw earlier in orientation, some of you have slipped in as we've gotten, gotten started today, and that's all good. I hope you've got a worship guide. Uh, you might want to go ahead and get that thing out and ready if you need a worship guide or if you need a pen, if you need a refill on your coffee. Whatever it is that you may need to get you through this morning service, all of that is out in the lobby. Or if you want the, the digital version of that, just scan one of those QR codes on the back of a seat in front of you. I am not going to be bothered or offended if you notice that your coffee cup has gotten low and you need a refill. That's going to be perfectly fine with me. And in fact, if you want to bring me a cup, I would accept that as well. Um, fun times around here today. A few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter service, right? We celebrated Easter. We had service here. And I'm sure many of you have certain Easter tradi traditions that you do like after the service. Our family, after Easter service, uh, our whole entire family goes to my Meemaw's house. We gather at Meemaw's for, for lunch, and that has been and forever will be the gathering spot for our family. After any kind of holiday, special event, you name it, if something big is happening, we are going to Meemaw's house. And when we go to Meemaw's house, everyone is assigned a dish to bring. And what I mean by assigned a dish, what I mean is you brought something once, and because you brought something once, now that's the thing that you have to bring forever. And there's no swapping it up in our family. If you brought a green bean casserole one time, that is your dish forever. You will always bring a green bean casserole forever. Now, there is a, a way to get reassigned a dish. And that's if you mess up the recipe. Because everybody knows how it's supposed to taste, right? And sometimes you, you cooks in here, you just can't help yourself, can you? You, 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 we've been doing it this way forever. And, you know, I just want to experiment, right? Uh, yeah, you're nodding your head because you, you know it. I'm just going to experiment a little bit. But then what happens is you might experiment too much. You might mess that recipe up. And you might get reassigned a dish, which is typically ice or rolls. So don't. Don't get assigned ice or rolls, all right? True story, two weeks ago, we're at my Meemaw's house, tiny little kitchen. We got a little island right there in the middle, and on this island are all the finger food type things. We got the devil eggs. We got the rolls. We have some fruit. And, of course, we have my sister's cheese ball. Why? Because five years ago at Christmas, my sister made a cheese ball, and now that's the thing that she has to make forever. And I will admit, it's a really, really good cheese ball. Amy does a great job with this thing. And at... Depending on the, the event, depending on the holiday, like Thanksgiving, she'll make it into the shape of a turkey or Christmas, it's a tree. It's really, really, really good. The people love it, all right? Well, my cousin David and I are at the island. We're eating from my sister's cheese ball, and we're just, you know, enjoying ourselves. And he looks at me after a couple of bites, and he says, did Amy make this cheese ball? Of course she made the cheese ball. It's here, right? Yeah, yeah, Amy made it. It's different Dangerous words in a kitchen at a family event. It's different. I take a few bites. I'm like, you know, David, you're right. It's, it's like the flavor's stronger. He's like, yeah, it's good. It's really good, but it's different. And he calls my sister, Amy, what did you do to the cheese ball? It's different. And I know that is a stress-inducing question um, to anyone who brings a dish to a family event when someone asks you, hey, what did you do to this thing? It's different. And immediately you get defensive. You're like, I don't know. And my sister says, it's the same recipe. I did, I did what I always do when I make the cheese ball. He's like, it's really good, but the flavor, it's just, it's like, it, it's so strong. Like the ranch in it is just right there on the, I mean, it's, it's, it's good, but it's different. She said, oh, Oh, I used a different brand seasoning. I didn't have the name brand seasoning. I had off-brand stuff. So I just used the store brand seasoning. It's like, that's what it was. That's it. it. It's good. He kept reiterating, it's good, but it's different. Isn't it funny how if you have like a family recipe that just the slightest adjustment completely changes the entire dish, Right? I mean, just the smallest little tweak, and it doesn't take much. You have a perfectly fine recipe. The people love it. It's great, but maybe you get a little bored with it. Maybe you get a little impatient. Maybe you're in a hurry, and you don't have all the name brand stuff, so you just grab whatever's in the, in the cabinet or in the pantry or in the fridge, and you just make it work. And, you know, you add a little here. You take away a little there, and the people are like, oh. I don't know. This doesn't taste right. It's different. I'm not saying it's not good, but I am saying it's different. It's not how it's supposed to be. 
So as we've studied through Galatians the past several weeks, Paul is appealing to the believers in Galatia that you don't need anything else but Jesus to have a right relationship with God. It truly is Christ alone. And he's making this plea, stop trying to add something to that. Stop trying to tweak the recipe, if you will, to follow the, the illustration that eventually breaks down. Mind you, I understand that. Stop trying to add to him. Stop trying to take some things away and tweak it. It is perfect just as it is Christ alone. This is all you need. And we know that as we've walked through this letter that false teachers have come in. These teachers have perverted the gospel that Paul proclaimed and established these churches on and began to lead people wrongly to believe that keeping the law or practicing uh, certain rituals in addition to Jesus is what's essential for salvation. So as we get to the end of chapter 4 today, Paul is aggressively addressing the heresy that's going around. And instead of uh, just calling it out point blank the way he's done in earlier chapters, he does a, he does a, a different thing at the end of chapter 4. He, he basically leans into this, to this group and says, let, let, me, let me tell you a story. If you've ever had those words said to you when you know you've messed up, maybe it's from a dad or a granddad or a boss or a mentor, you know you've messed up and you know you're about to get corrected. And instead of just being called out for all the many ways you messed this thing up, that person looks at you and with great care and affection in their eyes, they say, son, can I, can I tell you a story? If you've ever had that said to you in that context or in that moment, you know exactly what that means, and you need to listen. You need to listen good because they are about to correct you in the most loving but firm way possible. All right, And this is what the Apostle Paul is about to do. He's going to tell a story, and to be transparent with you guys, this is one of the more troubling stories in the Bible. There are worse stories, but this one ranks up there. When we really look at what a husband and wife couple resolve to do in order to fulfill what they think is the way that God wanted to provide a promise. It's so sad and it's so heartbreaking what this couple says, you know, I think this is the way that God wants us to fulfill this promise he's made with us. And the, the links that they go is just heartbreaking. And Paul is going to use this event that we'll read about in Genesis in just a second to hopefully help the, the, the believers in Galatia and you and I today avoid some of these pitfalls that, the, that this church has fallen into and serve as a healthy reminder for us. So the first of these being this, it's not on you to fulfill God's promise. It's not, if God makes a promise with you, if he promises to you, as you're reading through scripture, there's promise after promise after promise in Scripture, as you're reading those and as you're claiming those, it's not on you to then go and figure out, okay, this is the promise that he's made me. Now, how do I go about making that thing come to fruition? That's not on you. However, what we're about to see in this, this story from Genesis is how a couple tried to do that on their own. Let's read, starting in Galatians chapter 4 first, what, what is this story that Paul is going to tell? And how is he going to bring us back to when God makes promise, it's not on us to fulfill that. Let's read in verse 21. Let's start there in Galatians chapter 4. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. So like he's done throughout Galatians, Paul is referencing the Old Testament, specifically Genesis here, and this promised covenant that God made with Abraham. So let's, let's jump back to the beginning. Let's go to Genesis, and let's look at what is it that God promised Abram. So we go to Genesis chapter 12, and this is what we read. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. 
And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This was the promise, this was the covenant that God made with Abram. And when God made this promise to him, Abram was around 75 years old, and his wife Sarah was around 65. She was 10-ish years younger than him. And if we're all just being candid with each other this morning, you don't just wake up one day when you're 75 and 65 respectfully and say, you know, today is the perfect day to start a family. We've been waiting our whole married life for this, and I think today's the day that we're, we're, we're going to start the fam. Yep, this, this is the day right now. That, that's, we know that's not how this works. Clearly, this is how God wanted this to come about. This is the promise that he made. And later on, after some years go by, he reiterates this. He says this again because Abram is starting to doubt this promise. He's starting to have some questions. He's starting to have some concerns. And in Genesis chapter 15, he cries out, Oh, Lord God, what will you give me? I continue to be childless. And God answered, Your very own son shall be your heir. And years went by. And years went by. Still no children. And, and it's not too hard to see how he would begin to question and doubt and wonder, All right, Lord, what... What are you really up to? You made me this promise now a long time ago. Nothing is, is, is happening. How is this thing going to be fulfilled? The clock's ticking and no progress has really been made. And it's, it's been almost a decade. And there's, there, there's this terrible saying, and I, I really don't like this saying. We need to just erase this from our, from our repertoire, right? Um, the saying kind of goes, God helps those who helps themselves Sort of thing. I really, I'm not a, not a fan of the theology behind that statement. God helps those who helps themselves. But this is where Abram and Sarah's mindset eventually goes. Well, God made us a promise. It's been a long time. Maybe it's time for us to help God out. Maybe it's time for us to step in and help God out. And so Sarah brings out her servant, Hagar, who was young, attractive, and said, Abram, look, it's clearly not happening with me. So maybe you and Hagar should have a child together. And maybe that's how God wants to fulfill this promise that he made you. M maybe he's just been waiting on us this whole time. Maybe he made this promise to us, and he's just been waiting for us to figure out how we could do this. You're like, Frank, how on earth do they get to that conclusion? Like, what makes a married couple go to that, that box and say, maybe this is the solution? I'm not making excuses for Abram and, and Sarah in this moment, but culturally, if you look around the customs of their day, this isn't too far of a stretch to see where they would have gotten this idea because this was a pretty socially, socially, mind you, accepted thing. So they could just look around and say, well, all of these other couples are doing this kinds of stuff. Lord has not condoned that, by the way, just so you know, so you, it's clear where I'm standing today. I'm just trying to help get into Abram or Sarah's mind of what makes them go from trusting the Lord all the way to doing this. She is literally suggesting, how about you have an affair so that you can fulfill God's promise? This is where we're at. And so this is what they end up doing. And I want us to, to, to think for a moment, this may be a, a, a stretch for us, I was talking with Pastor Allen earlier this week as I was kind of just reviewing over my notes. I said, Allen, you know something that, that I, I've picked up on throughout this? It's not that Sarah stopped believing the promise. Like this action that she's doing, th this solution that she has come up with, isn't because she has stopped believing that God made a promise to Abram of bringing him a son. This isn't a moment of disbelief as much as it is a moment of her thinking, well, maybe it's on us to figure out how to make this happen. She's attempting to fulfill the promise of God through this scheme of the flesh. And so she brings out her servant to Abram. And interestingly enough, Abram doesn't make any objections to this, which tells me there are more issues going on with him than just a lack of faith here in this moment. He says, okay, you know, if this is what you want us to do, then I'll go along with it. So we got some character issues with him also. Shortly thereafter, Hagar gets pregnant by Abraham. They have a son. They call him Ishmael, and Ishmael will grow up to father a great nation, but not the nation 
of promise that the Lord intended. The result of this, of course, is absolute disaster. As you read the chapters following in Genesis, Sarah hated Ishmael. She treated Hagar harshly to a point where she has to flee for her life with Ishmael. It was a mess. Years later, keep going, years later, Sarah does indeed have a child. And we read in Genesis chapter 21, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord said to her, as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. So these two, two children have some things in common. Both of them were sons of Abraham. They both had the same biological father. Both of them were circumcised as the Lord commanded Abraham to do. And both of them grew up in the same home. And they also had some pretty big differences between the two. One was the result of a husband and a wife trying to manipulate a promise to come to fruition through human scheming. And the other was the result of God fulfilling his promise in his perfect timing and according to his will. One was a slave because his mother was a slave and he was born into that slavery. And the other was born free, the heir of a free woman. So you have this story this tragic story of two sons, and it's disturbing on every level with all sorts of hurt and family dysfunction. And it reminds us that as we read through scriptures, we read from cover to cover, it's not just a book that is full of great people with great moments, with great stories that experience, you know, God's goodness because of the greatness that they brought to him. And in, in reality, from cover to cover, it's a story of broken messy people, time and time again, failing the Lord, yet time and time again being recipients of his great grace. And Paul shows us as he opens up this, let me tell you a story time with this church in Galatia, he shows us a couple of ways that you and I relate to God. Two mindsets, if you will, of how we relate to God. One is Jesus plus nothing, and the other is Jesus plus something else. Two sons here are perfect examples of how we relate to God. But both of them, all right, both of them have the same end in mind. The Jesus plus nothing and the Jesus plus something else. The, the relationship with Hagar, the relationship outside of Hagar, both have the same end in mind, meaning they both want the blessings that God has promised. It wasn't that Abraham had stopped believing in the promise that God made with him. They still believed. They just began to think wrongly that it was up to them to make it happen. Abraham decided he would have to help God out by relying on his own efforts for God to accomplish his purpose, and the result was an absolute disaster. And for you and I today, this is a great example of what happens when we, each and every day, try to do things on our own efforts in order to win acceptance or favor with God. It doesn't work. It's not much different, no different than when Abraham took Hagar as his wife so that he could create his own heirs. Not what God had in mind, and it didn't accomplish what God, uh, what his purpose intended. So Isaac for us, though, represents this other way of how we relate to the Lord, this Jesus plus nothing mindset, that we rely on only what God can do to realize that we have nothing to offer God but our own inadequacy. We don't bring anything to the table other than our inability. All that Abraham and Sarah had to do, all they had to offer God were their old tired bodies that were far beyond any ability to produce children. And all they had to do was bring that to him. Lord, here we are. There was nothing in them that was capable of producing life. And that's exactly the way that God had intended and designed this to be for them. Ishmael represents our own efforts. Isaac represents what only God can do. One results in an absolute mess. One results in experiencing God's great grace. And it's amazing. So we have, we have, we have this this truth that we have to wrestle with today and it's that your self-effort and your faith in God don't live in harmony with each other. Self-effort and faith in God cannot live in harmony. Listen to what I'm not saying. I'm not saying faith and works don't go together. I'm not saying that. 
Go to James, read James later today. I'm saying self-effort as an attempt to earn more of God's love or earn, earn more of his acceptance or maybe self-effort plus your faith. Maybe that'll make me closer to God. Maybe that'll help him get closer to me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this part and also have faith. Those two things don't live in harmony. This, Paul says, is exactly what the Galatians are doing when they're turning back to the law. They're going back to an old way of living in order to bring them closer to God. They're attempting to fulfill the promise of God through their own scheming of the flesh. Just church in Galatia, they haven't stopped believing just like Sarah and Abraham didn't stop believing. They just think it's on them to accomplish it. They're going back to the law, thinking that obeying the law is the way to salvation on top of faith in Jesus. And, and I bet Abraham came to a moment of regret. I would hope that he came to a moment of regret and remorse and just shame of, I cannot believe we did this. And I'm just going to give you this nugget this morning. This is not in your worship guide. It's not on the screens. But just I'm just going to throw this out here for you. Um, you don't fix a problem with sin. Sin only creates more corruption. So if you're identifying a problem in your life, if you're identifying something in your life that is that is. I need this fixed. I need this gone. I need this done better. I need this to go away. And if the solution that you come up with, if, if, hey, this is the thing that will make me feel better, or this is the thing that will make this go away, or this is the thing that will make all things, you know, oh, perfect in my life. If that answer is sin, then that is not an answer that you need to pursue, okay? That is not the answer that you need to pursue. Sin, God never, I, I, I have read this. I don't think I've missed it. I've never seen God call us to intentionally sin in order to bring about some goodness in our life. It's not here. He's not calling us to do that. So just put that out there. It may seem for Abraham like a good idea one day. You know, I think, you know, honey, this is, this is a good solution for us. But the end result of this whole situation with Hagar ended with envy and anger and bitterness and jealousy and hate. Which leads us to our second point today, that Jesus plus anything else you put in that blank will lead to slavery. Jesus plus anything else, if you're trying to add anything else on top of the finished work of Christ, you will forever be enslaved to that thing. All right, so let's read Galatians 4, verses 24 through 27, as Paul continues this story about Hagar and Sarah. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Paul uses these two sons to describe the relationship with God and what one looks like through self-effort and what one looks like through grace. And what happens when we try to add on top of Jesus' finished work, when we try to add, add to what Jesus has done through our own efforts, what ends is our being enslaved to that thing. We're bound to that thing. When we take matters into our own hands, what we produce is enslaved because we are enslaved. And it's not the freedom that we've longed for. We don't experience the freedom that we long for. Let, let's unpack this further. The irony of this is for us who try to earn God's approval through our own efforts, here's the trap. No matter how hard you work at it, you always feel like you're, you're, you're not accomplishing it. You always feel trapped. You always feel enslaved to it because you never know whether you've done enough. You're always left wondering, have I obeyed enough? Did I think good enough thoughts over? Did I think more good thoughts than I did bad thoughts today? You're never quite sure if you've measured up to what God's expectations and standards are. You're enslaved to that. And whenever you think you need to earn your standing with God, you end up just like Ishmael. You never fully taste the freedom that he intends for us. Not so with Isaac. Because Isaac, remember, is born into freedom as a child of promise. And when you and I experience the gracious gift of God's grace, his salvation through Jesus Christ, we're spiritually born into that same freedom. And there's no going back to something else. 
When we receive his gift of salvation, it's a freedom that can't be taken away. And for us, this is what we, we need to learn to practice better each and every day. That there is there's no potential. There, there's not, God doesn't need any potential from you to work the miracles in you. That's the beauty of the gospel. That he's not waiting for you to show, here's the potential that I have, Lord. Now what can you do with me? There's no potential in you that he needs or is waiting for in order for him to produce the miracles in you. This should be a relief to us. Like, okay, pressure taken off. It's not what I bring to this relationship. The fact that an old barren Sarah will be more fruitful than a young, attractive Hagar you would never think that when you look at them. One has great potential, ideal candidate for motherhood. The other has no potential for that. Yet God chose the one with no potential to accomplish his promise. And that is the beauty of the gospel, that he doesn't need from you anything in order to produce in you that promise that he's called. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And you may think you have no potential I need us to think differently that it's not about you anymore. It, this is hard for our students because uh, we, we teach this down in the hub regularly. Hey, as you read through scripture, don't read this through the lens that this is a story about you. You're a part of this story, but this, this whole thing cover to cover is about Jesus, about what Jesus is doing, what Jesus has done. You're a part of that, but don't read this as if you're the number one audience. Don't make this about you. It's all about Christ, specifically about Christ in you. What that means for us today, though, it means it doesn't matter what you bring into this place. Whether you come from the most messed up background, your resume is just a litany of one failure after the next, high school dropout, prison, divorcee, fired from your job, addict, whatever it is, God can still bring about his promise through you because it's not about you to begin with. It's about Jesus in you doesn't matter if you're barren. Christ supplies everything. Not 99%, not 90%, not 50-50, everything. Stop trying to add to it, thinking that there's something left out. That wouldn't be the good news of the gospel if there was something left for you to try to magically figure out what's the missing ingredient. Christ in you. If God can make something of Abraham that the Bible describes as good as dead, then he can make something of you for his glory and for your good. That's an important order there. Why would God do anything with me anyway? Why would he choose me of all the people with my past, with my present? Why would he choose me for his glory? And as you are living your life to bring him glory, that's when you experience most good. Not the other way around. Hey, God, I'm going to do all these good things, and I hope, that, I hope to bring you glory for this. God, I'm just going to live faithfully and obediently to you each and every day for your glory, for your honor, and whether you bring me much or little in this life, I am going to experience most good in that moment. Gets us to our next and our last point today. So, what, Frank, what do, I, what do I do with this? Here's something we're going to have to, to learn how to do. We need to learn to live when it's not easy, and what we mean by this is you will find trouble and trial and persecution as you try to obediently and passionately follow the Lord from the same people who are claiming Christ but adding to their walk with Jesus something else that doesn't belong. You're going to face persecution, so we need to learn how to stand firm, let nothing move us, and to live when it's not easy. Let's finish up Galatians 4, verse 28 through 31. We'll get a better picture of what Paul's talking about here. Now, you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, slave but of the free woman. So remember how I said earlier, just a few moments ago, that uh, your self-effort and your faith in God, they don't live in harmony with each other? Paul says that those saved by grace will always be hated and persecuted by those who are seeking salvation through law and through self-efforts. 
Ishmael's descendants would become sworn adversaries to Israel, even to this day. And it's interesting to me that today, across the world, Muslims claim proudly Ishmael as their spiritual father, yet Islam is a religion that from start to finish teaches salvation through works. It's all works-based. And Paul predicts that anyone who rely on obedience to the law, and this is whether we're talking about the Judaizers in Paul's day, um, the Catholic Church in Luther's day, Muslims in our day, or even legalistic Christians within our own churches, will hate and resent those who solely rely on the promise of grace for salvation. Why is that? Why is there this tension between works-based and grace-based? Why? Why? Why is there this infighting? Here's why. Because the gospel of grace says to them that all of your effort and all of your zeal and all of your passion and all of your knowledge and all of the good that you're doing, it doesn't actually bring you any closer to God. Because you are powerless to do anything that accomplishes your own salvation. Because remember, it's not about you. Salvation belongs to God alone, Jesus plus nothing, a gift that you only receive by faith. You may be doing a lot of good, but those good things aren't making God love you any more than he already fully does. All right? You're not going to have him love you any more because he loves you fully already. Paul writes uh, in Romans chapter 5, God shows us his love for us while we were still sinners. God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The picture of his love. If Paul had to earn the love of God, how could he ever be loved, right? Think about Paul's life and think about what he lived prior to meeting Jesus. To have to earn the love of God is an unbearable burden that we cannot carry. God loved us. He died for us. And while we were still sinners at that point, that is when he demonstrates his love. Paul could have said, but God, I've murdered people. You might say, God, I'm a liar. I'm abused. I'm an addict. And if my friends or if my family knew the things that I thought, knew the things that I think, they'd be so ashamed. Yet Hebrews teaches us, God says that the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, he's not ashamed of us. Why would he do this for me? Why would he do this for me? This is a question that haunts so many people. Why would God love me? Why would God love me? There's no way he could love me. Paul had nothing good to offer God. And here's, here's the truth for us. Neither do we. Paul had nothing good to offer him. We have nothing good to offer him, yet it pleased God to save us, and he does not regret doing so. That's the kind of love that breaks hearts and replaces it with a new one. There's a quote that's uh, one that I've been repeating to myself pretty regularly it's by Brennan Manning. It goes like this. My deepest awareness of myself is that I'm deeply loved by Jesus Christ, and I've done nothing to earn it and nothing to deserve it. Here's a takeaway for today. Just one last point for us as we close up that a, a do-it-yourself religion, a do-it-yourself DIY religion will leave you frustrated and enslaved. We might love some DIY projects around the house. We might love some do-it-yourself stuff in the yard or in the garage. You can save some money here. You can, you can customize it just the way you want it. But as soon as you try to DIY your faith, what happens is you grow more and more frustrated and more and more enslaved. The grace of God, it's a scandalous grace. Because our God is a God who is not ashamed of us and will come after us in our darkest of places. And the greatest thing for you and I to know and to preach to yourself daily is that you did not and you do not earn the love of God. Since we can't earn it, it doesn't matter how, hard, how far one of us has fallen, there is hope and there is grace and there is mercy in Christ Jesus. Something that you can walk out of here remembering today is that you are truly, truly loved beyond compare truly love. Let it pray for us this morning as we close up today. And then I'll lead us through some next steps in just a moment. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this moment that we've been able to come and to sing songs that remind us of your grace, a grace that we do not deserve, but a grace that you offer to us. God, we thank you for your word, and as we have studied through Galatians, reminder after reminder after reminder that our justification is rooted in Christ Jesus and not in our own efforts. God, that we can truly wake up each and every day and celebrate 
Easter, if you will, every single day that your, your death, your life, your death, and your resurrection is what provides us that relationship that we can have with you. That your son Jesus finished the work required. God, we thank you for your son. We thank you for his love. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen.